Okay, this is Dan Fort, and I'm at Torrance Beach in Southern California, South Bay, staying with the original Bel Airs. And why don't we do this American Bandstand style and introduce yourselves. Well, I'm Dick you Dodd, and I play drums. Okay. Paul Johnson, rhythm guitar. Eddie Bertrand, guitar. Chaz Stewart, sax. Okay, <laughs> and what year did this all start, Paul? Uh, about 1959, me and Ed met on a school bus and decided, we discovered we had each just been playing guitars for a, a couple of months, and so we decided to learn together. That's pretty much how it started. So what kind of music were you guys listening to at that point? I was listening to Duane to Eddy and people like that, the Ventures. The Fireballs, Johnny and the Hurricanes, yeah. Link Shadows. Ray. So from the beginning, it was instrumental music. Yeah, yeah. hardcore. In the beginning, though, was it yet surf music. No, there was no such thing as surf music. It was, uh, there was, the surf culture didn't even really happen around here till, I mean, the pop surf culture, you know, came in about 1961. And uh, we were just basically playing, you know, playing our music. And that all kind of just happened together. You know, the, the, we were developing and the kids who were surfing around here started identifying with the band. And that's pretty much how the whole idea of surf music came about. So you just happened to be geographically located near the beach anyway. Yeah, yeah right. So what role did everybody play in the, in the group at that point? Um, not just instruments, but um, you were the arranger, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I was, yeah, we had kind of clearly delineated roles. I, I was the musical arranger. Uh, Dick Delvey, who's not here today, he was the original drummer and business manager. And Eddie was kind of the front man, a lead guitarist. And Chaz was kind of like the wise man in the group and the guy who <laughs> tended to, eat. when all the other leaders couldn't figure out which way to go, Chaz would kind of step in and he was a straighten us out. There was actually four of us and a fifth member we should acknowledge, Jim Roberts, was our kind of part-time piano player. We brought him in to kind of lend a little more musical credibility to what we were doing. He was the best musician in the group, I would say. And, okay, with the personnel, either four or five members, two guitars, sax, piano at times, and drums, the one missing link here was no bass. No now, bass. how would that work? <laughs> we didn't know any better. <laughs> so we compensated. I mean, Paul played thick rhythm, yeah. and he was full. We played big. I played as full as I could. We just didn't know any better. We didn't miss the bass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the melodies you played were sort of twangy-ish. Exactly. Bass string Yeah, bottom melodies. end stuff. So bass would have gotten in the way of our material. Mm -hmm. I have a funny That's feeling. A fact, yeah. I would say that it, uh, a lot of our style was defined by working things out without a bass. We, there were certain aspects to our arrangements that, that I think were unique for that reason. We are now in the Knights of Columbus Hall in Redondo Beach the site of some early Bel Air's dances, I take it? Yeah, uh, that first summer of 61, after we'd recorded Mr. Moto, but before it made its way onto the radio, we set out to get a, a following to start making something happen. So we wanted to have a, a dance in the local area where the kids from the beach could come. And so this place is just about a mile away from Torrance Beach. So we picked this place, printed up some flyers, and handed them out on the beach. And sure enough, we pretty much packed this place out. It didn't take much either. We'd go down to the beach hanging out and just tell 20, 30 people there's going to be a dance tomorrow night and it would be packed. It would be insane. Yeah. And then through that summer, we actually had five dances uh, total. Three of them here, uh, one of them at the Eagles Hall. We kind of outgrew this place. We had to get a bigger hall. So we went to the Eagles Hall in Redondo Beach, uh, which held more like five or 600 people. Um, and then bigger yeah. places, the Biltmore, second floor. Hermosa Beach. Hermosa, Hermosa Beach. Beach, Biltmore. Yeah. It was great. We were 16 year old kids making 250 bucks a night. Yeah. And, and this was in the days, night, night in the night. this was before nightclubs as such yeah. really booked much rock and roll live. Well, basically, no, there, w that wasn't happening, so we had to make it happen. We, we kind of played that summer out with our own dances. Then the following year, the early in the school year, we had our hit record, so by the next summer, we were ready to have our own club. Yeah, called the Bel Air Club. Next up. All right, let's go. Come on, we're going to show you. Okay, we're now at Catalina and the corner of Torrance Boulevard, which is now Razzmatazz Records, but used to be the Bel Air Club. 
So this is where you guys pretty much experienced your heyday, yeah. briefly in 61, 62? Uh, 62. This was, this was like, actually this didn't really get going until late 62 through 63 yeah. and into 64. It started out as the Bel Air Club, then it changed in 63 I think to the Revel Air Club. And after that, it, yeah. It, after that, it had a brief stint as the Third Eye, during the early stages of the folk Hippies. rock psychedelic time. And then a, the Rodano Beach couldn't handle that, so they said, "Let's get this out of here," and they hmm. turned it back into a warehouse. Did you still play there when it was the Revelaire? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yep. Who, who was Rev Foster? Rev Foster was a, a disc jockey from uh, KRLA at that right. time who became a, in, in partnership with the people here. Okay, in this period, this personnel of the Bel Airs, you guys were on some local TV and whatnot? Oh yeah, yeah. We did, uh, what, Wink Martindale Dance Party and yeah. P.O.P. Dance Party and uh, what were some of the other things we did? Uh, there was uh, Bob Eubanks. Bob Eubanks, there was oh, yeah. on Riverside uh -huh. yeah. and Burbank. And Lloyd Thaxton, right? Lloyd Thaxton, Thaxton. Right? Thaxton. Yeah. show. Yeah, Lloyd Thaxton. <laughs> we made the rounds. Yeah. But it was pretty much a regional stardom. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, people never heard of us in Des Moines. <laughs> <laughs> people heard our record in New York, though. Okay, now we're in Palos Verdes, the town where the Bel Airs grew up. This is the plaza here. We're going to talk about the reunion that took place in October 1986. How did this all come about, Paul? Well, uh, Peggy Cox should be given credit for starting it off in 1981. She is an old-time fan, used to come to the Bel Air Club and the Revel Air Club, and she kept all kinds of stuff. A lot of the memorabilia we're using for this video is stuff that she had. And uh, she organized a, a reunion in 1981 in which she contacted all the people that were connected with the South Bay surf music scene. That She tracked down a whole bunch of them, got a mailing list together, and we had a reunion at uh, Leroy Pollock's house in Lomita in 1981, where it was just guys getting together, having fun, and didn't do a lot of playing or anything, just visiting. Happened again in 1983, and then uh, at, by that time, it just seemed to me and to some other people more and more like we ought to really do this thing up and get a hall and get the bands together and play, and, and uh, so that's uh, what we finally decided to do. Okay, and you had, in the last few years, gotten active playing instrumental music with mm -hmm. your group, the Packards. Yeah, that was part of the reason why I wanted to do this is because I had kind of had the vehicle going for it with, with the newsletter that I have. Uh, I figured I could I could get the word circulated and get and let the people know, and it was time for it to happen. And on the other hand, Chaz, how long it had been since you played saxophone? I hadn't played Dan for 23 years, but, <laughs> but I went and got a hold of a sax and practiced a couple months before the reunion, and it was a terrific experience to play again with the Bel Airs. It was really fantastic. Paul came down, we played for a night, and it was just sitting there staring at each other going, that's just exactly how it sounded, mm -hmm. it's exactly how it felt. The purpose for the rehearsal was to be authentic. Mm -hmm. I hope we did that. It, it was a phenomenal to us. When we got together to practice and then at, again at the reunion, it was phenomenal how, mu how much it felt just like it felt. Mm -hmm. and in, fact, in fact, it was really wonderful because w we were able to play the tunes the way we always wanted to play them when we were kids and didn't have the, the uh, dexterity to do it. And now yet, the chops you know? were up for the task. Yeah. 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 But I, I will say, I remember when we got together uh, at the rehearsal time, just before the thing, we went out to dinner and I remember sitting at, at a table together and the thing that we we just were overwhelmed with the good feeling. I mean, yeah. I can genuinely say yeah. for the Bel Airs, and I think just about all the groups there experienced the same thing, yeah. that there was such a warm thing happening as far as being together again and experiencing this thing again. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember just sit, it was it got almost kind of kind of mushy yeah, between us. I remember we all had grown up together. I mean, yeah. we were seeing people that it got real nostalgic and real. All the bands knew each other. It wasn't mm -hmm. like we, you know. You know, you're in a band and you don't talk to the other guys in that other band. It got real, everybody was really good friends back then and it, it seemed that way that, yeah. that day at the reunion. Mm -hmm. It was really great. Hi, I'm Phil Dirt and I'm here at uh, Gonzales' restaurant with the second generation Bell Airs. Hi guys. Hi. Hi, Phil. Hi, Phil. Good to How see you here? again. Thanks. Artie, you uh, joined the Bel Airs about this time. Where did you come from? I was in a, a, a band called the Journeyman from 1960 to 1960. 
about 1962 and a half, and that's when I joined the Bel Air for 63, somewhere along yeah, the yeah. When uh, When Eddie and Dickie left the original Bel Airs to formatting The Showman, which basically grew out of Eddie and I uh, developing into a little bit different flavor. You know, we each wanted to do our own thing. And I kind of, at that point, attached myself to Artie because I, I really related to, what, to his style. He was more coming from sort of an R&B background and, uh, and Chaz also had a feeling for that sort of thing. And Artie came in and brought with him George Dumas, who was the original drummer in The Journeyman, who also kind of had that that sort of pocket. And then we, somewhere, I forget how this came about, but we came across this guy named Steve Lotto and brought him in to play bass, which was the first time we had a bass player in the Bel Air. And he was a good bass player. And he was a good bass yeah. player. He was from the he East came Coast. He from the East Coast, too. Yeah. He brought in a definite influence yeah. on the yeah. playing. It was the East Coast, style. yeah. It definitely took it into a whole broader direction, and it became more of a, like a, a of a, a, a rounded out kind of R&B flavored uh, instrumental band. And uh, we played at the Bel Air Club with that lineup for probably about a year or so. About a year, yeah. And I still can't help you how we get 900 to 1,000 people in that club every, you know, every weekend for a year. Yeah. yeah. It was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, it, the place. It but was the sound was, the sound was um, more of a polished sound than the original Bel Air, definitely, and a little different influence. And, uh, you know, it was definitely a shift in the style of music. But as far as now, we're getting to this, seg this segment of the Bel Air, of all the bands that I was in, right at this point, now, this is the best sound that I personally felt that I play in this band. Uh -huh. Steve Lotto, Paul Johnson, and Chaz, and uh, George and Tiny. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the Thanks. best sounding band that yeah. I played in, although I did a lot of recordings later on. But uh, yeah, it was great. In person, it was, it was the great. best. That's yeah. why it was good we, we, know, we knew it in Paul's yeah. living room. Yeah. We were clean. Yeah. It was the one of the cleanest sounds and precision discipline group I've uh, you could ever want to hear because people knew their roles, were willing to accept roles and not, the egos didn't seem to get in the way. This particular generation of Bel Airs came into being was that Paul Johnson and I started just kind of getting together on the side with the, our guitars and there always seemed to be a, a, a chemistry, some kind of chemistry. I, I can't really put my finger on it, but uh, we seemed to, to have the same mind and like the sound that we were uh, putting out, and even after we would play from 8 to 12, Paul and I would go over to Shakey's Pizza Parlor in Torrance and play from midnight till about 2 in the morning, just he and I. Right, yeah. And uh, it was just uh, the two guitars we used to, I don't know, just to, just to, I don't know, I still can't describe it. Tiny, did you ever uh, get into any of the recordings with the Bel Airs? Steve and I did a couple things later on uh, under the name of the Bel Airs. We came out with a record on, uh, on a token label. Lucky Token. Lucky, no. It was, uh, well, it, yeah, Silver a, Label. Yeah, right. And it was called uh, uh, Charlie Chan yeah. as a late, late follow-up to Mr. Uh -huh. Hoda, uh -huh. also a fictional Oriental detective. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the other one was called Baggies, the, uh, uh. the other side. It's going to change the whole life. So, Artie, then you thing. went on to the Challengers. Yeah, I see the Challengers as a, really an extension of, of anything that we've said in, over this reunion and, and the surf music. The Challengers just happened to be just another band and uh, I was disappointed at first I can remember feeling frustrated on stage a little because the band wasn't as tight as the Bel Airs but we did we did start making record a lot of records and by 1965 we had gone to the Grammy Awards and, and done just about every major TV program around so the group did attain a measure of success a lot of groups didn't make and in that sense the challenges were extremely fortunate but never really had the the, uh, the sound of the Bel Airs in my thinking. So after it was all said and done, the Challengers did about 18 to 20 albums that are still around today. We're in Costa Mesa today, about 30 miles or so down the coast from the South Bay area, and we're talking with Eddie Bertrand of Eddie and the Showman, formerly. Eddie, how did uh, how did Eddie and the Showman actually come together? I know uh, you you actually had members from a couple of other South Bay bands at the time. Tell us a little bit about that. Basically, Dickie Dodd and I split from the Bel Airs, and when that happened, Eddie and the Showman formed, and we found people from local groups to join with us. 
Uh, the band was actually together for a couple of years, and there were a number of individuals that came in and out of Eddie and the Showman during that time. Can you run down uh, the names of the people that played with the band? Oh Drummers were Mike Mills, Dickie Dodd, Mike Mills, Terry Hand, Skip Hand, Tim Boyer, hope I don't leave anybody out, guitar players, people like Rob Edwards, um, John Anderson of the Humans, right? Humans? Uh, Larry more Larry more Carlton. recently, yeah, more recently went into the humans. Right. Yeah. Larry Carlton played for a while. Um, Freddie Buxton, sax players Bob Knight, Sterling Storm, who also played with uh, John Anderson. Why was Eddie and the Showman so popular locally here in in the Southern California area? Beats me. I guess they just liked our drive. You know, we were pretty crazy people with a very aggressive sound. Were there any other bands at the time you can remember that played with a similar sort of attack uh, to the music than, than you guys did? Seems like most of the bands that we came in contact with, either on tour or at retail, uh, like the Lively Ones and uh, the Safaris and these, they were all pretty aggressive guys, you know, basically getting that same sound. Define surf music for me, will you? What? <laughs> what? What is what is surf music? Rock instrumental music. A little wetter than most. Uh, surf music. It's a hard question to answer. Who were your early musical influences on the guitar when you first started learning how to play? Who did you listen to? first person I listened to was Dwayne Eddy, and I bought an album of his and learned every one of his tunes note for note. And that kind of got me in that register on the guitar. When Paul Johnson and I met and formed the Bel Airs, basically we, that was who influenced me, was Dwayne Eddy and the Ventures, and we went from there. What was your reaction when Paul called you up last year about getting the, the old guys in the band back together again for a show? It's bizarre. I mean... When we went on stage, I kind of stepped back and said, now just relive as much as you can the feeling and what you had before. And looking down at Paul and Chaz and Dick on stage, you know, to, to the person that they grew up with, to a person that's knowing them, they don't change physically. You know, you, your eyes see them as they always were. So it was kind of just, immediate time machine time. I just, bam, here we are. And that's how I felt. I really did. And the audience made it that way. Kept it that way. Kept the energy. Hi there, I'm Bob Daly, and I'm sitting here with PJ and the Galaxies. How you guys doing? In case you don't know who these guys are, over here on my far right, we have Steve, we have Jim, we have Skip, and Paul Johnson, hence PJ and the Galaxies. Prior to Paul Johnson getting into the Galaxies, the band was fronted by Tom Starr. That was called Tom Starr and the Galaxies. And for a little background information on that band, we'll be talking to Skip, the drummer. Well, we, uh, when we started playing with Tom, uh, Steve and Jim and myself, we... Uh, pretty much followed in the footsteps of the old Bel Airs. We were playing a lot of the Paul Johnson original tunes and a lot of the songs that they had uh, had played. And I think probably me in particular, I, uh, I liked that type of music so much that uh, when Paul became available and was willing to, uh, to work with the three of us, we just jumped on the opportunity to bring him into the band and, uh, and start working with Paul on a, on a steady basis. Well, for me, it was... Uh it was the right opportunity at the right time. <clears throat> I had been playing rhythm guitar in the Bel Airs uh, for two or three years. And uh, when I first met Jim, Jim used to come to the club all the time when we were playing at the, at the Bel Air Club. And uh, he used to stand there and, and, uh, and uh, watch what I was doing. And then one day I ran into him at, at, uh, at Hogan's House of Music, which was the local guitar store that, uh, that we all went to. In fact, I, we should mention Chuck of Hogan's House of Music because he yeah. was an integral part of the South Bay scene. Anyhow, <clears throat> gave us a lot of credit. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We got all our guitars there. <laughs> Uh, I ran into Jim there one day, and he said, gee, let's jam. So we, we sat down, and it was phenomenal. I mean, it was kind of actually kind of freaky because he had played, he had figured out how to play my rhythm style, and so I got to uh, play some lead to Jim's rhythm, and it was, it was really great because his, his style was so, uh, was perfectly compatible because he played just exactly the way I would have played it. <laughs> like playing with yourself, wasn't it? <laughs> You know, I, I always think of the, of the galaxies in a way as like the, uh, as far as, we were later in the period, like the Bel Airs were early and then Eddie and the Showman and the galaxies came a little later in the period. And, and I really think that we were kind of like the, uh, the uh, summed up what, what the South Bay style had come to be, you know, that the, the galaxies were, a, were a, a real South Bay band, whereas Eddie, <clears throat> you know, went off, he played at Retail Clerks, which was over in Anaheim, which was not directly a, a part of the, that state that phase was not really directly south bay he had kind of merged with the orange county type of sound at that point and the gap but the galaxies in fact all these guys still live right here in the south bay and just pretty much steeped right in whatever it is that the south bay sound is all about yeah i think one thing that's worth mentioning too is the fact that we did it all instrumentally because uh at that time mm -hmm. Most bands in the area were singing. They were, they were vocals were happening, background vocals, and um, and we were able to carry a strong melody through the song and keep interest up from song to song strictly on an instrumental value. And I thought that, that was, was really real, unique. Yeah, Very few so bands important. could continue to do that. Every song would tend to blend from one song to the next, and it was hard to discern the the differences. But our tunes individually stood by themselves and I, I really enjoyed playing them for that reason. I guess because yeah. we had a, a, a different sound, original. Super clean, you know, absolutely clean. Every note could be picked out. <laughs> we did a lot of real different um, material too. We did a lot of old early rock and roll stuff from the 50s and we did current stuff and we did some English stuff, things that a lot of other people weren't doing. And some classics uh, too, you know. Um, we, we, we had the surf sound, we had a little bit of rhythm and blues, we had a little bit of blues and everything in our sound. And we picked out oddball tunes, like I remember we did one called The Whirling Dervish. And, yes, yeah. And we did, uh, we did, uh, what's that one, uh, Wild Goose. Wild Goose. Wild Goose. We yeah. had these, uh, you know, we would pick uh, old tunes and derive our own versions of them, you know. And, uh, you know, just, did, we had a lot of fun with that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, I remember that night very well, right after I introduced you guys and you started playing. I could really feel a lot of magic in the air and the people responding to you guys. How did you feel? That we only had the one rehearsal for the, for the show and uh, it took just setting up the drums to calm me down and, and get, get into it a little bit more. But I, was, I was vibrant. I was just uh, really alive. I walked off of that stage tingling and I, I stayed as, as long as I could until I could hear everybody play. You know? I had a ball. Yeah. Uh, I, I was amazed even at rehearsal like after we did the first song, we still sounded like the old band after all these years. I was really nervous. I hadn't played for a long time, and I was, I didn't really get over being nervous till the next day. <laughs> um, it was really neat to see all the old people there. I mean, the whole audience was made up of people who used to come see us, you know, in the '60s, and so that was that was pretty good. Hi, I'm Dominic Priori, and I'm here with Dave Marks and the Marksman. Tell us, Dave, introduce us to the guys. Well, this is Bill Trinkle, bass player, Marksman, and uh, Mark Grossclose, drummer. And one more that couldn't be here tonight, uh, Kip Brown, rhythm guitar player. Okay, uh, how did you guys get started as a group? Well, I saw these guys in a garage. Uh, I was in the process of quitting the Beach Boy band, and uh, they agreed to... Uh, play in a band with me, and I had some songs, and we recorded. Got on A&M, Warner Brothers. And your first record was a song called Cruising, which you played at the reunion. Right. Uh, it had sort of a go-go dance rhythm guitar to it, and surf lead guitar, and uh, drag race lyrics. It was a wild combination. How did you come up with it? Well, we were just playing on our roots, um, you know, uh, surf music adventures, Dick Dale, the Bel Airs. Um, just basic, obviously the Beach Boy influence. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, Chuck Berry. Just 
trying to do our roots. We liked it too. We put together a two and three part harmony uh, vocal track and uh, it had that drive and surf, uh, surf band uh, kind of a track to it and uh, added vocals. Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. Okay. Your third record, I Want to Cry, had a very strange uh, sound to it. Actually, it was a bit ahead of its time. You had folk rock 12 string guitar, you had a British English invasion sound and also some surf influence and some really strange droning vocal sounds and it all came together really well. Can you tell us about the sessions for that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> you just you just said it. We, we had the, uh, the English uh, influence. Well, we started off with our, our surf band influence and our instrumentals and the Beatles came out at the same time that uh, we were doing our, our instrumental stuff and uh, well, before the Beatles, we were doing like we were trying to get uh, the Beach Boy harmonies into our surf uh, instrumental band, instrumental guitar music. Mm -hmm. Kind of try to integrate that in, in with the Beatles sound, and uh, it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> we bombed. <laughs> how did you develop your lead guitar style of playing, and did that carry over into the Moon, or how did it go? Um, my, that's rhythm. Uh, my influences were, uh, I can remember, there's the Ventures, my, like Carl Wilson, mm -hmm. I can safely speak for him too, because we, we live right next door yeah. to each other, and we played guitar, we, we grew together, it was like, well, we listened to the Bel Airs, mm -hmm. we listened to the Ventures, we listened to uh, Dick Dale, mm -hmm. and uh, Dwayne Eddy. And that was like our, our, our roots, right there. And Chuck Berry was in there, too. Chuck Berry was definitely in there. Tell us about when you first discovered you were a Beach Boy. When I first discovered that I was a Beach Boy, uh, it was when, before I was a Beach Boy, I actually willed myself into the Beach Boys. See, I rehearsed with those guys, and then they went off and did a session without me. It was a surfing. It was called Surfing. Mm -hmm. And it was a local hit. And then Al Jardine quit. They asked me to be in the band, and we did Surface Safari, which was a, like a national hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Al got back in the band when Brian decided he wanted to stay home and write songs. So we were six Beach Boys. Okay. Al went on the on the tours with us and did Brian's parts. And Brian stayed home and wrote and produced the sessions. What was Brian working like in the early days? Well, he he worked the band. He wrote the songs and he uh, taught the boys how to sing the harmonies and produce the recording sessions. And he stayed home and did that. David, look into that and tell me, what ever happened to David Marks? Well, he became a father and a devout musician. He became a good musician, and that's why he's not making any money now. And he's a father, and he's a, and he's a good guy. here with Paul Johnson and the Packers. And here we have Paul Johnson playing lead guitar and uh, writes quite a bit of material for the band. Paul, uh, how did you get involved in, in uh, or I should say re-involved in the whole uh, instrumental music scene back in the early 80s? Basically what happened with the early stuff, with the Bel Airs and, and that whole phase, it kind of got cut off at a certain point, you know, about the time of the British invasion. And ever since then, I've felt like there's just been this long parentheses, so to speak, you know, and that in 1980, we, be, be, we began to pick up again where we left off, and now we're moving ahead. It's not so much that we want to redo what we did back then, but we want to start again where, where we left off and, and go on with it. Ideally, we don't want to be bound by nostalgia, um, though the tonality of the band definitely has its roots in older stuff, so it's going to be called nostalgia. Uh, we want to evolve, but not necessarily, I think, in a trite way, you know, by throwing synthesize, synthesizer sequencer bleeps in the background and stuff. But um, I think the main thing is we just want to kind of be ourselves and, and see what happens from that instead of uh, any, any uh, contrivance. Originally, it, it, it began, the instrumental music that we're playing began with Dwayne Eddy and Link Ray, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there's a larger genre there, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're trying to build on that broader foundation 
And uh, in the course of doing that, we play surf tunes, and, and uh, sometimes I turn the reverb up, and sometimes I turn it down, because uh, I want to explore the whole spectrum of the thing. Right. It's fun music, mm -hmm. you know, really. And, um, and basically, the difference between it is it, it seems to have, I, this really seems stupid, but it, uh, it has kind of a happier type of feel and, mm -hmm. and sound to it. <laughs> like, the kids like it. Mm -hmm. People my age like it, and mm -hmm. uh, my mother and father-in-law, you know, they <laughs> like it. Right. They, everybody likes, Great. you know, the band, it's got the music that hits the whole spectrum.